Hi everybody, it's Tim Beatley here from the University of Virginia. Happy to have this time to talk a little bit about the Biophilic Cities and its connection to Half Earth. I had a hand in, in helping to create this global network of cities around the idea of biophilia, which is something that E.O. Wilson has had such an important role in uh, popularizing and, and helping us understand. It forms the basis for our vision of what cities can and should be in the future. Biophilic cities are profoundly natureful. They work to connect their residents to the natural world, and they do everything possible to incorporate nature into the design of that place, from rooftop gardens to living facades to food-producing gardens to urban wildlife incorporating trees and forests and biodiversity in all forms, we imagine a immersive nature, a nature in which humans living in cities are not separate from, but are a part of the natural world. Let's start out by visiting a neighborhood in Portland, Oregon, where we find a very unique species, the Vox's swift. These swifts have lost much of their original old growth forest habitat, but they've adapted by taking up life in the city as they move through the city during the month of September roosting in, in very dramatic fashion, a chimney in an elementary school. So we're in Northwest Portland at the Chapman School, uh, which is home to what we believe is the largest vox swift roost in the entire world. They're in the process of migrating. They spend their breeding season up here in the Pacific Northwest into British Columbia. They're a long distance migrant. And one of the things that swifts do is they form these giant communal roosts. They all gather together in the evening and if we still had many around, they would roost in hollowed out old growth trees. They would use hollow trees to roost. We don't have a lot of those left. And so they've substituted chimneys. <laughs> it's a very pleasant evening on the hillside. It's a fun place for kids to play. You'll see them sliding down the hill on cardboard boxes. Good place to picnic. Just a place that builds community. And I think it's uh, just an incredibly positive thing to see a community come, around, come together like this in the middle of a city around nature. And it's fun and entertaining for families, but this has a lasting educational impression on the young people. And I think for many of them watching this, the spectacle of nature, it's a lifelong memory. A number of our biophilic cities also have programs for educating kids about nature and actually incorporating nature into the teaching mission of, of schools. One wonderful example in the Atlanta area is the Chattahoochee Hills Charter School. And it's a very different kind of school. Uh, the kids come prepared every day with their coats, their boots, and they're prepared to be outside. And they're prepared to take their lessons and to take their math and, and their science and to go out into the forest. Let's hear from a few of the kids involved in that program. Great. We came up here sometimes and we planted some things. We have to plant them and we have to learn to know what they are and we have to do some research about it and learn what the plant needs and then we plant it. We're outside a huge percentage of the day. And we have to bring our discovery journal to like write about what we learn on the trail and what we're seeing. They're not afraid and it's, it's so amazing because we wear our uniforms and that's because we tell parents, don't expect your child to come home clean every day. Now I'd like to share a story that takes place on a truly impressive scale. Reforming a city's metabolism from one that's biodiversity destructive to one that's biodiversity restorative. That's not easy or simple. But people in New York City are doing just that in the case of the New York Harbor. The water is the new sort of front. And of course there are challenges with that situation because we we face, you know, plus 30 inches of sea level rise in the, the sort of midterm, and uh, we have increasing storm surge and hurricane activity, and so we develop this strategy of a breakwater that is then seeded with oysters. So it is a it is a piece of infrastructure day one that takes the wave action and lowers the velocity of this the wave action, combining that with an onshore dune to reduce flooding, okay. and that structure is seeded with oysters uh, through the Billion Oyster Project. Uh, what are we looking at here? Um, we're looking at two different species of algae. We have the isocrisis and we have the tetrasomus. So we feed our, our larvae and our oysters two different types. 
So the tetra would be more for the adult oysters, mm. and the isocrysis would be more for the larvae, since they're so small and they can't really in digest the tetra because it's so big. So this is basically a setting tank. It's where we oh. stack <laughs> bags, of, bags of shell and for larvae. Larvae is basically... They're oysters. Yeah. Oyster yeah. larvae, yeah. Baby oysters. Baby oysters. And they, after a while, they tend to set and they need something to set on. So we use reused oyster shells, which we get from restaurants when they throw big shells. Everywhere you go on the planet, if you want to increase and preserve biodiversity, um, if you want to slow down climate change, this idea of rewilding natural places and unnatural places, I think is a really powerful concept that we really like the idea of here in New York Harbor. What's particularly exciting about it is that there is not a constituency that's really against that. Um, because we, particularly because Billion Oyster Project was born out of the Harbor School and we had great relationships with all the maritime operators in the Harbor. They trust us, so they know that we're not going to try and do something to injure their use or diminish their use of the harbor. This is one of the most ultra-urban, highly degraded marine ecosystems on the planet. And yet these oysters are living. Kids are getting engaged in planting them. We've done 20 million. I think it's a really exciting to think about it, not just as a model for what it means here, but for what we can pull off for biodiversity around the planet. Biophilic cities is an international movement, and American cities could learn a lot about how to thrive with nature from cities around the world. I'd like to travel now to Singapore to close out this segment. One of the most important things we can do to foster biophilia in young people is for them to be able to see it. Seeing nature right where they live heightens their appreciation and gets them asking questions. It's a gift for a lifetime of learning. Here's a beautiful story of what one city has done to support a single species and in the process has restored an entire urban river ecosystem. It's always good to see a, a wild animal and even a predator living within a highly urbanized city like Singapore. I mean, people would just expect uh, our rivers and reservoirs to just be uh, to just serve the function of flood control and, and maybe to store water. But to, have to see wildlife and to see otters within our highly urbanized country, I mean, it, it, it kind of gets people excited and want to know more about wildlife. And I think this is a very important stepping stone for, for them to get closer to nature. So maybe otters is the first step, and then maybe they'll get to learn, know more about the ecosystem that otters are living in. Maybe they'll, they'll be interested in the fish, or maybe they'll be interested in some of the mangrove environment that the otters may also live in. And from then on, uh, having a closer connection to nature. The ecological footprint of cities has a huge impact on the natural world, often distant nature. So there are some really essential roles that we believe biophilic cities can play in advancing the vision of half-Earth.